29. Twenty-nine. We're discussing Windows 10 today. Um, well, um, I mean, I, I. You're not. You're not going to have to have us clash you as the Antichrist, are you? By saying the M word. Yeah. I'm no, like, say, so my problem with Windows 10. Uh, well, I'm, I'm just going to say this: that since 2008, I have not had to relearn how to use an operating system because of all the stuff moving around on me. <laughs> Funny how that works. You know, uh, since Windows, certainly since Windows XP, uh, I'm not either. The thing I've had problems with Windows 10 is my video card doesn't like uh, doesn't get updates through Windows 10 for some reason, and it doesn't want to accept the ones that it sends me. And I've had a couple of programs uh, that didn't run on Windows 10 that gave it a conflict. Oh, really? Well, I didn't I, have any, I, I, any issues. I, I, really, I really liked Windows XP, actually, when I was using it. And then they said you can't use Windows XP anymore. Uh, you have to have Vista. Vista, and I tell you, that's a great recruiting tool. Yeah. You know what? I, I would agree with that. Vista. Uh, that, that's you know, when I switched. I said, nope, I'm not learning. I'm not learning how to do it all over again. If I have only, to learn anything, I want to learn the something. Only good, um, well, there were some bad versions of Windows, I will admit that. But it, when, if you waited, Windows, and, waited to know, yeah. if you waited to know what the you know which ones were stable. XP. A lot of companies are still using XP because it was so incredibly stable. Uh, uh, Windows are, are like win Windows operating systems are kind of like Star Trek movies. Every even number. <laughs> no, like, that same every problem. other one is bad. And yeah. uh, Windows right. Seven was very good, and Windows Ten is very good. But uh, the ones in between there, yeah, I agree. There were some problems. My understanding is that Microsoft is really pushing Windows 10 because they plan to stay with it and just do minor updates. Uh, it's not not something they're planning on updating every year or two. We'll see if that holds true or not. Yeah, yeah I, I think you said that, Mac that Wayne, didn't you, it went on, my, on my thread? I'm sorry? Didn't you say that on the thread, Wayne? Uh, no, I'm not on Preacher Talk. Uh, oh, okay, okay. Oh, so somebody, yeah, 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 somebody mentioned that very point. Oh really? Uh, about Windows 10 is supposed to. That they're talking about keeping Windows 10 through like 2020. So yeah. he so, went out from among you. What's that? Wayne went out from among you. Not one of us. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I left it too. Uh, yeah, I, 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 just, I go out from among people. I, I went out from Windows users. I went out. From, um, it's just a whole thing of things. Uh, to me, there's. Paul, there's one singular disadvantage to Windows 10, and I'm one of those those rare users. I've got a computer at the house that I use uh, Windows Media Center to record off the antenna, so that you know store all of our our, our TV shows we want to watch, save money, and you know walk away from the big cable conglomerate. Uh, but Windows 10 automatically removes Media Center once you do the update. I, I heard that. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's one. So that one computer will stay on Windows Seven until I quit using it. But all the other ones, obviously, are going up. Right. Right. All right. Well, well, like I said, I, I'm going to do it while it's still free, which well, it, it ends in June. It's and 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 uh, I just I just got to find the the right time to to do the transition. That's the. That's that's the challenge here. I, I did the same thing, Tom, anticipating uh, the big learning curve, anticipating, you know, I didn't want to do it on a Saturday night, you know, when I might be wanting to review my materials or modify yeah. or update uh, or like on a Wednesday afternoon. Uh, but the reality is as soon as it, as soon as it updated, um, everything went, uh, I mean, it was just I picked right up and kept on going, so... Oh, Tom, okay. I do have to warn you. You use two monitors, right? Yes. Off a desktop, correct? Yes. All right, you've already got Windows 8, though, installed, right? Yes. Make sure you update the graphic drivers to the most recent before you do it. All right, what happens is, and I remember reading about this after the fact and figured it out, but um, I had three monitors hooked up when I updated my office to Windows 10, and it came up to a black screen. Long story short, if you don't update the graphics driver, 
it will default to the built-in monitor. I had to unhook all the monitors and plug up only one to the built-in graphics and not my graphics card. Once yeah. I did that, I could see something and finish the process. Yeah. And I just, I, if Mine I didn't even do that, mine worked right out of the box. Yeah. Um, with a desktop or a laptop? Desktop. Desktop. Okay. Yeah. Mine. Yeah. And and uh, yeah. And and like I like I was saying a few minutes ago, I, I've had a few Windows 8 updates that did the same thing. That 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 uh, you know, I got one <coughs> monitor. And and uh, and then I had to just unplug everything. Matter of fact, it wasn't my primary monitor, so I had to unplug basically, and then just plug in the primary monitor. One of them's USB, and one of them, or or I'm not USB. One of them's HDMI, and one of them is whatever they call the the the, the blue cable with the two screws. <laughs> yeah, VGA. Yeah, VGA. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Well, one of them's HDMI and one of them's VGA, and, and I had to unscrew or I had to unplug the H or or the V uh, the HDMI one so that it would recognize the VGA, and then plug it back in, start at a time or two. <laughs> Anyways, All that's right. what it is. Let's get underway. Yeah, let's study the Bible a little bit. Yeah, uh, well, this is a Bible study. Uh, well, it, you know, it's clearly a topic that's important to everybody, ex except for I, uh, I'm, I'm waiting to hear in our chat here somebody about, like, what I got when I asked this question on Preacher Talk, uh, get, get get a Mac. No, no, <laughs> that's just a, uh, yeah. Hey, hey well, 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 my response to the get a Mac is I tell you what I'll do. I'm going to set up a GoFundMe account and ask for $5,000 so I can get a new Mac and a laptop. And when I raise that, then I'll be glad to switch over. <laughs> oh, don't forget, you've got to upgrade the logos as well. Yeah, hey, well, that's not a problem. Logos upgrades. So it's included. But anyways. It's a, it, I feel like it was a worthwhile investment for me. But, you know. Yeah. Right. There, it, it there, was, <laughs> there was a time in the computer history that it was without a doubt if you had the money, the way to go. I mean, you go back to Windows 3.1, and you had preachers envious over the few that had Mac systems, and people were abandoned. Preachers were abandoning the Windows right and left if they could afford it. Uh, but nowadays, it's just it just depends on your software preference, I guess. You could always go with Linux. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that, yeah, that's the cheapskate way. Speaking of the third choice out of the box, let's. Talk about some Bible today. That has nothing to do with third choice out of the box. That, that should have been our first choice. That's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, bear with me just a moment. One more switch here. Yeah. All right, here we're getting ready to begin. We're going to start with verse 29. Um, we just didn't quite get that finished up last week. And then we'll finish up chapter 11, see if there's anything we need to uh, review over it, and then step on into chapter 12 of Second Corinthians. Sound good? Sounds yes, good. Sir. All right. And three, two, one. Greetings. I'm John Duvall. Welcome to another Truth Factor discussion. You know, the time each week we come together and discuss the Word of God and see how we can factor the truth into our daily lives and hopefully yours as well. If you're joining us for the first time, we want to let you know we'd love to have you participate in our study. We do have a built-in chat room that you can sign in using the guest option, or if you have a chat roll account, you can use that, or even maybe Facebook if it works for you. And be sure to jump into our study. Let us know where you're from if this is the first time. If you have any questions or comments, we will be following that, and we'll bring them into our discussion as we go along. Gentlemen, it's good to see everyone this morning. I trust that there are no major problems in the world for any of y'all. It's pretty broad. Oh, yeah, boy, it's hot <laughs> out here. Uh, pushing 90. I don't know what we're going to do. <laughs> oh, pretty soon you all fall off into the ocean. So, <laughs> See, that's why I live in the center part of the United States. You know, we could lose both east and west coast, and I'll still be all right. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> uh, un uh, until the tornado picks up your house and takes it to the coast. <laughs> or the earthquakes. Yeah. <laughs> we have more earthquakes than California. 
lately. Exactly. Yeah. So, anyway. Well, speaking of shaking things up, let's talk about the Apostle Paul. And um, last week we talked about his charge, or not his charge, but his defense against those who were bringing charges against him. And we spent some time talking about him in a in, in a way that he would have rather not done it, kind of bragging on himself in verses 22 through 27, and showing to the people that the ones that they have chosen to listen to who were maligning the name of Paul and so forth, Paul has the credentials and the qualifications to warrant the brethren's trust and confidence and not to listen to those others who were bringing these false charges against him. Were there any other thoughts or comments about what he went through as seen in verses 22 through 27? Well, I, mean, I wasn't here last time. It seems to me that the big thrust of the boast is that the, the Corinthians would not have seen these as things to brag about. In the ancient world, when you suffered, it was something that was viewed as, you know, you suffered because you did something bad and you must have deserved it. And right. so when Paul talks about how, oh, I was in prison and beaten and in danger and shipwrecked and all you know, the kind of commending things, they'd be like, why are you bragging about that? It's like bragging about here today. Um, but yet, that's Paul showing the foolishness of boasting and ultimately boasting in the Lord, as it says in 10.17. That's right, yeah. Um, any thoughts or comments about that? And, you know, we, in our life today, I can't really see any preachers being called upon to boast in a similar fashion. Um, right, I mean, yeah. Now, most nowadays, people, don't need, like, most people don't need much prompting. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah right. I, I mean, I mean uh, you, um, but, you know, like we did discuss last week, you know, kind of in reviewing leading up to this, because we got a couple more examples of it. Uh, uh, the idea of people establishing their credentials, we still see that today. You know, speaking, uh, you know. Speaking of credentials, I meant to. I wanted to ask Wayne this. Wayne, your your college education. What did you get up to? Me? Uh -huh. um, I got a master's degree. Okay, guys, we just elevated the show by one notch. Anyone else with a master's in theology? I, well, I mean, I don't like to bring it up a lot. but it's a, Well, like I said, we had to ask. You had to ask. Uh, well, I, I mean, I'm, so well, I mean we, we have an engineer in our midst, um, an IT guy in our midst, a teacher in our midst, a retired mili well, military guy, sort of. How about you, Brian? Remind me again. Uh, my background's in law. There you go. Ooh, a lawyer. Okay. We got a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, now, I'm sorry, I thought about that when we were talking about it, and I didn't have a chance to ask you, Wayne, so I was just curious about that. Ah, oh, okay, well, there you go. <laughs> but notice our bios don't go into great details of our past, so. No. Yeah, normally so. We count it as nothing, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And and that's the thing, you know, we, Paul Paul boasted in a way that that was necessary, I think, to try to get the people to listen to him. We're not faced with the same things today. The same circumstances, I would think. I mean, how many of us in describing what we've gone through as a Christian could list such hardships that Paul has gone through? You know, John, I think sometimes, though, preachers struggle with the difference between, uh, you know, as Paul is pointing out, perhaps a credential of his suffering. A lot of preachers just like to complain, complain about the way brethren have treated him or mm -hmm. problems they've had. And, of course, mm -hmm. in such circumstances, it's not an appropriate conversation. But, you know, complaining is different than boasting. You're right. You're right. But you might be saying the exact same yeah. things. You know, I the brethren treated me like this or that. And, you know, it, it, it could be the same kind of words but a different intent and purpose. Well, I mean, and sometimes, sometimes complaining about the brethren is done simply for the purpose of elevating self. By putting other people down, we necessarily exalt ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right, yeah. How, how many people would, like Paul did, sort of point to the fact that as proof of their genuineness as a preacher, they've been fired twice? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. And, and sometimes and, that's proof. Sometimes it's not. <laughs> right. Exactly. And, and I can imagine somebody that went through everything that Paul endured according to this, you know, uh, making sure everybody knew what they were that they had endured these things. You know. Well, if, 
if a preacher was to tell me that, you know, I, I've been fired from two or three congregations for teaching the truth. I only taught the truth and they couldn't stand the truth. I would say to myself, there's two sides to that story. <laughs> yeah, what is true? I'll, I'll either believe or, or disbelieve what you're telling me. With Paul, there's no two sides to the story. Yeah. So. Uh, I mean, in, in, in a lot of times, of course, it, it's designed. I, I don't think Paul's. You, know, you don't. Do you really see Paul getting fired from the places he's preaching from? You no, know, he's that wasn't attacked a good by out, I mean, he gets attacked by outsiders. Yeah. You know, because he proclaims right. the truth, and some people convert and some people don't. Um, there's never an it, it, as far as I know, it's where Paul, you know, it, the brethren just say, oh, Paul, we've had enough of you. You know, we're going to throw you out and not pay you anymore, which, of course, they couldn't do because they weren't paying him in the first place. He was taking money from other churches. But, uh, no, instead what happens is, you know, Paul's like, I'm going to show up and discipline you if you don't get your act together. Yeah. Uh, you know, and Paul's. It seems, if anything, that Paul's presence in the Corinthian churches is uh, demanded by the problems, not him being driven away from it. So, and, and just an observation, more or less. Um, hang on a second here. I mean, one other thing I think would be worth noting, you know, is I mean, people still people still boast according to the flesh today. I mean. Uh, when I was in India, for instance, sometimes this comes up. You know, people will introduce themselves. I was in one class, and people were introducing themselves. Oh, I have my degree in this. I have master's degree in this. I have doctorate degree in this. People would come up to me and introduce themselves that way. And I just kind of in the past, in the back of my head, wondering, you know, why is that how you start conversations? Yeah. Well, you is that a cultural. You know, but then I well, no, that's the thing. I mean, I think it's a there's a sense in which they really are. They really are trying to. Not everyone does that, but there were certain preachers I think that were doing that, and it was well, you know, because I think they are a little bit caught up in themselves, uh, very similar to what uh, in the ancient in the ancient world even. Um, of course, there are other preachers who, well, they, you know, they you wouldn't know it, you know, by they, they don't bring it up all the time, but they've suffered for the cause of Christ. I know one man, for instance, who I work with who. You know, he went to a village, he preached the gospel, and some people came in from the Hindu party, and they beat him up and said, don't come back here. They cool. drove him out of town. Um, now, that's clearly an instance of what you see, the kind of stuff. Look, look at the sharp contrast here between yeah. what Paul states and then what uh, what John talks about in the actions of Diotrephes. There's right. such a sharp contrast to that. Diotrephes wanted preeminence. Paul's just showing that through the simplicity of preaching the truth, he suffered a great thing. It's like we suggested last week. There isn't any of us on this panel that would sign up to take these classes in persecution. Uh, we're, we're not about to do that. But let's not lose sight, and I'm, I may be jumping ahead or pushing this ahead. I don't know, but at verse 28, <laughs> let's not lose sight of the greatest difficulty he had and that was the care of all these churches that he'd worked with. They were so so easily moved away from the stability of Christ at Corinth. Well, what's what's to stop the other churches that he'd worked with from being moved away from the stability of Christ? This was the, this was Paul's greatest concern, much more than suffering all these physical abnormalities. Mm -hmm. That's true. Do you suppose that he says in, in Galatians 6, this whole chapter in one statement when he says, from now on let no one cause me trouble for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. In other words, look, at I've got scars to prove my sincerity, um, you know, back badges off. Badges of honor. Badges of honor. That's a good point. That's a good point. That's interesting. Um, well, let's go ahead and read beginning in verse 28, and we'll read down through the end of the chapter, and then that'll kind of set us up for a discussion of this. So let's see. Let me get that ready. And who has... Um, I'll, I'll throw it to you if you'd like to read that. I'll be happy to. You, you feel up to reading. With your, yeah. I noticed your voice was a little bit... Uh, we'll begin in <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 11, uh, in verse 28, did you say? John? Yes, and we'll read down to the end of the chapter. All right. 
Uh, the scripture says there, uh, Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches, who is weak, and am I not weak? Who is made to stumble, and do I not burn with indignation? If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor, under Aretas the king, was guarding the city of Damascenes with a garrison, desiring to arrest me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. And I hope I didn't butcher those names too badly. <laughs> you did fine. I appreciate it. You did as good as I could have done, Paul. How about that? <laughs> All right. So, and this has already been pointed out um, earlier, what he says in verse 28. And the English Standard Version kind of separates it, whereas the King, New King James continues within the line of thought there. But the new ESV says, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. And as I think, Mike, you were pointing out, that really that was what was the, the, the greatest challenge that Paul faced. It wasn't the beast at Ephesus that he had to fight. It was ultimately his worry and concern for the congregations, for the brethren. Oh, I agree. And, and as an aside, I've always wondered whether the beast at Ephesus were two legs or four. Um, mm. what, what Paul endured is just absolutely beyond our understanding. We've, we've never encountered anything like this uh, physically, and I would dare say emotionally. Have we received threats? Certainly. Uh, have have we received persecutions uh, in various forms? Certainly. I came home one night and saw the side of my car mashed in by a brother or not, by by an individual, I should say, that uh, just didn't want us around. But nothing compares to what Paul endured, especially with the fact that all these churches. And maybe we need to explain these aren't denominations we're talking about. Right. These are local churches of Christ that Paul has either established uh, by preaching there or has built up by being there in some fashion. And his concern for the brethren, it, it might be better translated that um, the concern that comes upon him daily is the care of all the brethren that he knows. Each individual Christian became a great concern to him as to their stability in Christ. Um, we, we tend today to, to put that in the lap of the elders. Some congregations put that in the laps of the preachers. But the fact is, if we love one another with pure hearts fervently, as we're supposed to, we're concerned about each other as brethren, just as we're concerned about each other as a physical family. Yeah. Uh, you know, if a child was missing, you wouldn't wait till the next Sunday to find out why they're missing. Uh, if, if someone was sick, you wouldn't wait a month to take them to the doctor. Spiritually, we need to have, I believe, a, a greater acquaintance with the brethren that we worship with and, and work with than we do any other people on earth. That's a good point, Mike. That's a good point. And, and often the sad thing is by the time you visibly begin to realize someone's been missing services, the problem has already gotten to a point that is almost unrepairable because it yes. began before they quit coming. You know, this is just kind of the final stages of it, and it's harder to, to repair. Yeah. Uh, I got a question for you guys on the translation uh, issue here. Is is it what is it that was that you're seeing that's making you think that in verse 28 he's saying that this pressure or anxiety is greater than the other? It looks like in the ESV it just says apart from other things this there's also this daily pressure, but I don't see why we're picking up on that being somehow a, a worse burden than the other thing. I don't think it's worse. I just think it's more important. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I and and I would say the reason I view it that way is because in my mind certainly it would be the greater concern. You know, I, I mean, the, the spiritual versus a, a beating here or there. Uh, I, I mean, you know, not to be flippant about the beating here or there, those kind of things. But, I mean, um, I, I mean, how many of us, with, with whatever we're going through now, grieve at the direction that we see 
the Lord's Church going in some instances. You know, just the progressive attitude. And, and honestly, along with that, my concern about what we're going to be facing in the course of the next 10 to 20 years, if that long, if that long, I mean, uh, the gauntlet is being laid down, you know, by by a, a nation that is in no means a Christian nation, and, and uh, it never has been. You know, I, you know, I fully, I fully understand that, which is why I'm making that point. You know, uh, because we think we're going to turn it back into a godly nation by voting on candidate X. Well, uh, ain't ain't going to happen. You know, uh, it's not going to happen. And I mean, I mean, uh, but churches are about to start paying a price when they stand for the whole truth and preach on it. Well, have any of you that's ever? That's a concern to me had a congregation where you worked for in the past that uh, made decisions that grieved you later as Paul did? Uh, I can't think of one specifically, no. You know, I think I think with Paul it is very personal. I mean, he, he yeah. loves the Galatians where he says, you know, I can't believe where you've gone or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it seems that the Thessalonians, uh, Corinthians, you know, all these groups he's worked with, and then they he's gone, and they make decisions that just just utterly rip him apart. You know. Oh yeah. Him up. Oh yeah. Well, and, and and of course you look at Paul, and and you look at his the 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 churches that he's responsible for establishing. You know, um, and I'm sure he takes that very personal. Like, uh, I have not had that experience. Call it a blessing, if you, or, or or a curse, or whatever. I have not had the depth of experience that Paul has had in starting congregations, and 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 things such as that. I've I've gone to congregations that were established. Like I said, that that's not necessarily a. It's, it's not a. It's not necessarily a compliment, not necessarily a condemnation. You know, I mean, everybody's different. But but uh, but I, I can understand Paul. You know, I I was responsible for all these congregations being established and I'm very concerned that they're doing that which is right. So Eric, what's your thoughts on, on this since you kind of asked the question there? Oh, I'm I'm enjoying listening to you guys. I just was when I had read that I didn't pick up on him saying this was somehow worse than everything else. I just wondered if maybe it was something that I was missing. That's all. Yeah, I, I just kinda of think in, in all the things that he's that he that he had to go through this was something on a daily basis. You think about maybe a daily pressure, mm -hmm. not the random occasional problem, but you know. I um, mean, you know, on top of that, there, there seems there's an implicit rebuke of the Corinthians here again, because mm -hmm. you know here we are. The, the opponents have likely been using Paul's sufferings to kind of denigrate him, knock him down a level or two, mm -hmm. and Paul just kind of throws this in at the end. You know, by the way, the whole. Re reason I go through this is for you guys. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's the whole reason that Paul suffers is because he puts others before himself, because he puts these congregations before himself, including the church at Corinth. Yeah. And that's, uh, you know, that, that ought to be, uh, that, <laughs> that ought to kind of, it's you guys, it's for you guys that I'm doing this. I could, Paul could have done a lot of things that wouldn't have involved suffering, but he chooses the suffering because it's a benefit to these churches. Yeah, right. And, and 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 how much is it? Some of these congregations going along with that, you know, how much how much is it? Some of them cause him to grieve more than he should have to, if they were behaving themselves. Uh, go ahead, Paul. What were you saying? I was going to say that uh, certainly we we've given several warnings, uh, and I'll keep this very brief. But we've given several warnings about preachers uh, not boasting uh, in an arrogant and proud way. Uh, but there is a reality there that we need to see the value and the work that we do and, and not be ashamed of that. That uh, and I don't mean to pat ourselves on the back or to be arrogant about it, but Paul says, you know, I suffer these things. I think someone said it right uh, because of my concern for you. Uh, he doesn't hesitate to, to just let that be known that I, you know, I care so much about you. I care about the Lord's work, about what's going on with you uh, so much that um, I'm willing to suffer these kind of things. And we might, in, in a similar way, just let folks know that, you know, we're busy with many things in our lives, and the reason we are is because we love the Lord's work and and uh, not to undermine or, or 
play down uh, in some kind of either faux humility or real lack of self-worth or the worth of what we do, but to realize that there is great value in the work that preachers do. That's a valid point. And I think kind of what we're leaning towards is the, the motivating cause behind some of the boasting, you know. Um, but that's a good point. Wayne, with what you were saying just a moment ago, do you think verse 29 factors into that? Who is weak? Who, Who is, is weak? weak? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, and I noticed that Paul's when he was reading, his version read a little differently than mine. It's, who is, mine says, New American Standard, who is weak without my being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? Or um, mm -hmm. Literally, I think that says, who is led into sin without me being burned by it, basically. Like, uh, you know, it, it's kind of, Paul was living that, that whole principle of 1 Corinthians 12, that when one member of the body suffers, the whole body suffers with it. Well, when these people in these churches suffer, that falls on Paul. <laughs> and so he suffers along the analog of sufferings, how that, yeah. that has manifested itself in reality. That is interesting. Who is weak without my being weak? And who is led into sin without my intense concern? That makes a bit more sense than yeah. the New King James and even the ESV in some ways. Well, 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 I mean, the Greek thing is very... Very, very strange. Um, and I caused to stumble. It, it just translated it literally. Uh, and yes, most of the. I, I mean, you know, but I think some of the older versions just kind of render it with that literal reading, and, you know, it, the idiom seems to be more who is in this situation without my also being affected by it? Basically. Interesting. All right. Any, any other thoughts on that? Um, Wayne was having some a little bit of internet issue, and so at least from my end, you're kind of breaking up there on some of the discussion. But we we were able to get enough of what you were saying there, I think, to <laughs> uh, to, uh, to understand what you're saying there, and and it seems to settle down. Um, any thoughts or comments? I mean, the way that Wayne had kind of suggested in the New American Standard version's rendering of it tends to fit just a little bit better than, you know, who is weak and I'm not weak. It's like you say you're weak, but I'm weak, and um, who is made to fall and I'm not indignant. It's, it's interesting. Well, one thing we've seen from earlier studies in this same chapter is that when there were problems, you know, Paul couldn't rest. He was, you know, disturbed and... Um, I'm, I'm thinking of modern uh, applications of that that I fortunately have been have not been uh, have not had to experience this in an extreme amount. We've had some difficulties where I've been, but we've been able to work through them. But I have known brethren who I've known preachers who left the work because of the impact on them personally of trouble and um, maybe what they felt was personal rejection and and that kind of thing. Who just who just gave up preaching completely. And, um, you know, it can be a, you know, an enormous strain on someone to have to um, be around people, especially people who they counted as family who turn on them. And I think mm -hmm. Paul is experiencing that in this letter. People he had loved, people he had given himself for, and, and now he's experiencing them questioning his sincerity or his integrity. And um, it, it, we probably could not overstate the strain that that would be on, a, on, on any one of us to, to experience. That's a good point. That's a good point. All right. Um, any other thoughts about this up to verse 29? All right. So he says in verse 30, then, if I must boast, I'll boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, he who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. So if, if Paul's going to boast in anything, he says he's going to boast in those things that actually accentuate his weaknesses, not his strength. You know, it's interesting. There's another place where he says, "If it, it boast in the uh, the cross, and or glory in the cross." And so, if we boast about the cross, what are we boasting in except our own sinfulness and weakness? And so, that's an interesting. You know, if we're going to brag about something, brag about how what the, the mercy and grace that God has shown to us, and yeah. can't do that without making ourselves look small by comparison. Right. Yeah. And one. I, I still see the Paul painting. 
Paul in pain as he says this or whatever. You know, uh, I, I, I somewhat see sarcasm even in that statement, you know, or, you know, you know, driving home the point of everything that he's been dealing with. I am, uh, you know, if, if I got to brag about something, it's going to be in these types of things. Uh, you, you forced me to boast, which I don't want to do, but, but if I do. Uh, you know, you know. Since I had to, these are the things I am going to talk about, and, and incidentally, these are things that establish him from the standpoint of his faithfulness and so on. Okay. Well, let's see. I think Wayne was going to say something like. Oh yeah. well, I it was just I remember one one of my teachers one time said that uh, that boasting in the cross is like boasting about your uncle Joey who got hanged for stealing horses, and uh, so there's a certain degree of shame that comes with that and social stigma that is kind of lost on us today. In their yeah. setting, you mean? Yeah. In their setting, it would be like it would be like if we boasted that we had this uncle somewhere who got hanged for stealing horses. You know? <laughs> Especially if we lived in a time period where you were hanging for stealing horses. Yeah, I know. It was, it was a dated reference comment, but <laughs> still, I mean... <laughs> well, in, in the boasting, we see... Um, I've seen that Acts 5 uh, there where you see uh, they were before the council, uh, and I'm trying to look back and remember for sure. I think it was Peter, and it may have been John. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I have to search a little bit. But it says in verse 41, So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Uh, they were uh, they saw it as as an honor or a <clears throat> something most worthy uh, to suffer shame uh, for the cause of Christ. That seems to be what Paul is indicating. He's able to he gets he gets to suffer uh, for Christ. Um, he's becoming like Christ. All right. Here's an odd question, Paul. Do you think that there's a difference between Paul's attitude, that is, the Apostle Paul's attitude, and I'm asking the Paul present this question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> do you think there's a difference between Paul's attitude and what we would typically call uh, martyrism or the mindset of a martyr? Um, Paul anticipates that he's going to be a martyr, but okay. uh, but I I don't know that uh, you know if you're talking about like a martyr syndrome. Uh, yeah. You know, woe is me. Uh, Anything? No, I, I just think it's that here um, I've lived such a lived lived my faith to such a degree that it has caused uh, suffering to come about. Um, you know, Peter wrote about that. If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Mm -hmm. uh, let him glorify God on that behalf or in this name. Uh, so, okay. We, we can bring glory to God in that. It's not a personal exaltation. It's right. just uh, something that in our lives we are sometimes allowed to do. Okay. All right. I, I don't know if the question even had much merit. I mean, w there may be one in the same, but um, sometimes we hear about a martyr. We hear about someone who's dying for a cause, but as, as Paul is not dying for a cause, he's dying because. I mean, because of his faith and love for God. But he's living for the cause first, too. I mean, you know, he suffers, he suffers in the fashion he does because as far as he's concerned, he's already dead, and he's just given his life to the cause. So whether he's alive physically or dead physically, you know, is irrelevant. He's doing everything for Christ. Um, you know, people with martyr complexes, that, like you're talking about, they tend to have, a, I guess, this psychological need you know, like they can somehow justify themselves internally if they suffer at, uh, at the hands of others, regardless of whether or not they suffer for doing anything wrong. Uh, sometimes martyr complex is simply an attempt to avoid responsibility. Okay. Uh, the Bible, you know, like First Peter, for instance, talks several times, it's better to suffer for doing what is right than for doing what is wrong. There's a clear difference between them. And, oh, I mean, yeah. in, Paul, in Paul's case, you know, his suffering is simply a consequence of the fact that he's in Christ. You know, it's part of his attempt to imitate Christ. It's not based on some psychological need for uh, for sympathy or validation from others. It's simply his desire to be conformed to God. Okay, I have to say, I'm learning 
I'm learning a new word today. I, I didn't. I don't know about martyr complex, but when I just typed it into Google, I misspelled it as Marty complex, and the Urban Dictionary first response is Marty McFly complex. I'm assuming that's a different, <laughs> um, <laughs> different thing. Yeah. 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 Okay. You are my density. <laughs> that makes sense. Okay. <laughs> Harder um, complex. There it is. I see it now. Yeah, I guess what I'm looking up right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Okay. Um, <laughs> any other? Any other? Anyone else want to throw themselves down on the axe and and make a comment about that? Um, wow. Wayne, I appreciate your comments. I, I wish I had said all that before, but I didn't. And um, I, I really like that explanation. That, that that because I really think oftentimes. That's what it is. That's you know we, we have Fox's books of martyr, and and I understand the point behind that. But Paul wasn't a martyr for Christ. He, as you said, he was living for Christ. You know, and yes, he was willing to die for Christ. But um, it's it's different. It's, I, I think. And, it's different. and Paul avoided suffering when he could. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Always playing the Roman citizen card. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Of course, I wouldn't have meant much. 32 and 33 are about, too. What's that? You think that's what verses 32 and 33 are about? That Paul wasn't looking for, uh, yeah. looking for martyrdom? I, you know, I hadn't thought about that. I wish I had because that would have seemed a bit smarter. But, Brian, that's a good point. He leads right into an example of him escaping. You know. Um, um, go ahead. What kind of baskets did they have is what I wonder, too. I mean, this must <laughs> Maybe he was a little guy. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, you think about it. If, you know, think about it from this standpoint. Let's say uh, you know, houses in the walls or, or homes within the walls would have been, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 feet off the ground. It may have been easier for them to, to get laundry out, to get supplies in and out without carrying them up and down. So maybe that was a normal means of, of getting things in and out of the window. And so they would have had baskets heavy enough, you know. Um, not purely speculating on that, obviously, but um, I just thought that's a it's an odd uh, it's an odd statement uh, to kind of throw in here at the end after all is. that to kind of bring it up. And I always sit here wondering <laughs> why what's the significance of putting this after these other big points. It, yeah, I mean, we tend to think of you know like getting stoned would be a bigger deal than right keeping a city in a basket. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think some of the significance is built into the insignificance of it, you know, because it's not just, it's not so much that it's an example of persecution, so much as that it's embarrassing. Uh, you know, Paul to throw people in jail and arrest them, and then gets chased out of town like he's a criminal. Uh, he comes as persecutor, leaves as persecuted. Uh, instead of climbing the wall to scale the city and invade it, he scales down the wall and runs away. Uh, you know, I mean, you'd be like, well, Paul, why didn't you stand and face your fears? Why'd you run away? What is this, a cowardice on his part? He says, no, this is this is what the way of Christ has made, uh, has become for me. It's become a place where there is really a way of escape, but it's through shame and suffering and defeat and possible death anyway. Uh, well, do, you know, well, do you think verses 30 and 2 is the weakness he's referencing in verse 30? I'll boast of the things that show my weakness. Mm. God knows I'm not lying. I was let down out of a basket mm. through a window and escaped. That is kind of shameful. I think that fits, Wayne, when you put it that way. It does sound, it's not something you'd be bragging about. That, that makes sense. No. Well, nothing on this list is something you really should be bragging about. But well, that, That's how it fits. You know, Paul, right. I mean, you know, Paul, Paul's kind of making a mockery of the fact that they're mm -hmm. boasting. You know, this right. whole speech in 2 Corinthians 11 is basically... You know, is showing how stupid it is to boast according to the flesh, and how absurd. I mean, you know, he's answering the fools according to their folly, really. Yeah. All right. Any um, any other thoughts or comments on that? We talked about the potential basket and the weakness and Paul's point. All right. Any other any other thoughts on this? Anything else we need to look at? As regards to in regards to chapter eleven, okay. there you go. There's the basket. Oh, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, that was some basket, like I said. Here, Paul, click on your picture. Bring it back up there. I'm sorry. No, 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 that's fine. Which that's one? pretty cool. That's that's a like. That's a good likeness of Paul. Yeah. That's my the apostolic trading cards I have. <laughs> Show me what they look like. John, uh, just before we finish this, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, I'm hopeful that this is appropriate. I I really believe that especially as we preachers uh, mingle with the works, the, the separate congregations that we labor with, one of the emphasis that brethren need to understand is that there's there's not some superiority to the preacher. There's not, mm. uh, though elders have leadership, there's not some superiority that we put them up on a throne above us. We are to esteem them highly in love for their work's sake, certainly. But I believe that, that to factor this into our lives, which continues to be our theme in this study, mm -hmm. we need to understand how, how loving Paul was toward the brethren at Corinth in, and it's to me, he's trying to to pull their heart to his as well, that they might have this same love, care, and attention one toward another. When Peter talks about our fervent love one toward another, he, he's not talking about an acknowledgement of who you are and where you live. He's talking about the absolute understanding of one another's needs in order to keep them in the faith and in the work of our God. There's there's so many brethren that, at least, this is my opinion, so take it for what it's worth, but there seems to be a great many brethren who look at the Lord's church and their service within it with absolutely no more care and dedication than they would to a local civic organization. That's wrong. The Lord's church is the children of God. And if children, then heirs, and join heirs with Christ, and that makes us brethren. Yeah. If our physical brethren and sisters are in need, we're going to come to that attention. If they're wrong, we're going to come to that attention. That's the kind of repertoire that Paul, I believe, is seeking from Corinth, and that we need to exemplify and, and really grasp within each local work. That's a good point. Very good point. Um, any other thoughts on that? All right. Um, I've got I've got a completely side question that's been on my mind for the last few minutes in some of our discussions, or more of an observation. It is interesting where how to put this the the way the whole preacher system works nowadays, okay? Someone wants to go and uh, interview for a congregation, and the congregation, kind of like a business, uh, listens to the fella and decides the pros and cons of having the person and decides whether or not to hire the person. You know, then the person might look for another, or the congreg or a congregation will go up to the preacher and say, "We think you've been here long enough, for such and such reasons. We want someone else, and so we're going to give you six months to a year." It's hard to imagine that having gone on back then. You know, right? And, and, I, and I understand right. that at the time, and there is some some evolution of effect, in effect, if you would. Um, because we have to fill in where the Bible does it in matters pertaining to what we're talking about, where we're allowed to do that at least. But it's, just, it's hard to imagine the church in Ephesus telling Timothy, you know, we appreciate you working with us, but um, we want Titus to come work with us now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just, it's, I mean, it is what it is what we live in today and what we function in, but it's just mm -hmm. an, an interesting to observe the difference. Yeah. It's Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, I think there's a couple of key differences. You know, first of all, they didn't have this idea that they were limited to one evangelist. I mean, I think it's hard. It's hard to find examples where there's just one guy working in one place and no one else is there. Um, at the same time, mm -hmm. it seems, you know, that it's more about who's living in a particular area and working with that congregation. Um, Paul, of course, he doesn't take money from the Corinthians. But takes money from others. Apparently, so he will not be beholden to them, and so that you know there will be no strings attached. They have no real power over him as a congregation. They can't just say, "Well, 
you can't be part of this church anymore. It's like he started this group, and he's going to preach here whether you want him to or not. Um, so, I mean, that, that kind of mentality uh, definitely seems like a huge contrast. Um, yes. In, you know, one uh, thing I think... Interesting, I was... Go ahead. I go ahead, I Brian. Say, I was talking to <laughs> I was talking to my neighbor yesterday. He, I, it just so happens that my house is next door to the uh, parsonage for the United Methodist Church in town. So we're on our third Methodist par, uh, pastor at the moment that they move. But it's interesting. He said this is the time of year when they talk about um, moving, and they have a process in place. But there's a a guy I don't know his title, but there's a guy who's over the the um, region. Uh, I don't know if it's a synod or what the right terminology is. And, you know, the church has some say, the pastor has some say, and then there's this guy, he decides ultimately who goes where. And so he, they can move people where they want them to be. And we almost see Paul playing that role in the New Testament because he sends Timothy and Titus, you go here, you go there. But um, the fact is that we don't have that role in, a, in today, not having an apostle like Paul here. So we have to, as you said, uh, but use the word evolution, which I was surprised with. But um, we have to, we have to come up with a way of figuring out who's going to work where, and we're left to sort of our own judgment on that, I suppose. <laughs> the process evolved. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I need to delete that from the recording. I, that may come back to haunt me later. Uh, <laughs> go ahead, Brian. <laughs> uh, one thing I, I wonder, I think a lot of times uh, today among churches in America, anyway. Uh, my experience is that we don't look at the preacher as a qualified office within the church like we might look at an elder or a deacon. I've always felt that 2 Timothy chapter 2 gives a list of qualifications, a lot of which are the same qualifications that are with elders and deacons, you know, these things, but we don't look at it that. We do look at the preacher as more of a hireling, and that's certainly not the scriptural view of those things. Uh, and that Perhaps if we did look at it more like we're looking at the works of elders or deacons, that a qualified person to do a specific work in the church might might change the way we treat uh, evangelists in congregations too. Oh, I, I agree with that, Brian. And and there is where Paul talks about to Timothy do the work of an evangelist. While it's not in all an office within the church, it is a work, and there are qualifications for that work. You know, I know a lot of times people say, well, if you've gone to a certain preaching school or gone through a certain preaching uh, program somebody offers, you're, you're qualified to be a preacher. And I, I'm always, I cringe at that because I'm afraid it doesn't really uh, look to what the scriptures say are the qualities or qualifications an evangelist should have to do that work. That's exactly right. Yeah. Mm. There was um, a book I had, I think I may have gotten rid of it. It was an old book called Brano the Econoclast. And I have no idea what the book was about, other than I've, I've read through portions of it. Uh, but he, he, he was talking about religious schools. And it, it wasn't a member of the church who wrote the book, but he was talking about how the, the Methodists, they'll have a, a conveyor belt and a stamp. And so they'll have preachers stamped out and come, and the Lutherans from their schools and you know, and and different religious organizations will stamp out preachers to you know that they wanted to look like them teach, and um, I I think there's a bit of truth to that, you know, if if you're not careful, depending on what you require of the evangelist, you know, did you go here, did you go there, did you have this type of training, you may be looking for a a, a particular mold, not someone to come and teach the truth, but someone who fits a mold that you're expecting, As, you know. Right. And so. Okay. Well, I've 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 got one more question to ramble on. Um, if someone has any other uh, thoughts, real quick. Um, I ran across a fellow years ago uh, who wrote his own little commentary on First Corinthians, and he he took the position that a preacher's wife had to be a Christian. That that if he a preacher's wife if she was not a Christian then he could not be a preacher of the gospel. Huh. And uh, it's because of Paul's statement about Peter having the right to carry a, to have a believing wife, and from that statement he drew the conclusion that you couldn't preach unless your wife was a believer. Maybe you just can't bring her along. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, so, context. Yeah. Context. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't think you can get that out of that passage. Um, I just, Has anybody I ever mean, met you know, a preacher that his wife wasn't a believer? Yeah. I've, I, mean, I've, I mean, I've never met anyone. I've met preachers who are divorced, but... Um, but I mean, it raises—it does raise a question, you know. I mean, what woman would marry a man who chose to do that for a living if she herself were not a believer? And maybe there's someone who would do that. I don't know, but um, you know, well, he could it, have been it, a convert. He could be a convert, all right? No, he might convert, and then yeah, that's possible too. I mean, you know, I, I mean, there's situations. I'm I'm trying to think how. Uh, I, I mean, I'm trying. I, I, I'm just trying to even imagine how that scenario would even come up in the first place, uh, because it seems like the people I, I know, I know no one who's in that situation, but I know quite a, several preachers who are divorced. So yeah. it's kind of like, what do we do with that? Hmm. I don't yeah, know. Wife d- departed, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it, it could be. It could be the case where someone, you know, we talk about women marrying men who aren't Christians, but maybe a man decides to marry a woman who's not a Christian. And 15 years down the road, he keeps plugging along, and he decides, you know, I'd like to preach. You know, and so he decides to start preaching. She never goes to services with him. She goes to her own church, and it's like he's just changing occupations. Brian, if you if you know two of these scenarios, can is there a way you can say without uh, set, revealing anything too personal, like the, the basic setting of that? Yeah, well, one one uh, after he was married, he converted, and I should be careful to say they're not. Um, I don't like the term full time, but I, I would say they're not employed with congregations as evangelists, but they do the work. Uh, they do the work uh, with multiple congregations, and one of them is very effective. He's a very good uh, preacher, but his wife uh, is simply not a believer. Um, and then the other one I know. Uh, he he was a he was a believer and he married an unbeliever and then kind of solidified his faith to a degree. And with him, it was interesting because the conversation he he had had was that somebody said they'll never no congregation will ever hire you as an evangelist as long as your wife is not a believer. And uh, so he you know he didn't really pursue too hard uh, to have a a work uh, support him full time. A uh, practical point that I'll just make is that uh, it would be very hard for me to be engaged in a local work uh, in, if you want to use the term full-time, uh, giving you know, full effort uh, to the gospel uh, without my wife. Um, oh, yeah. it, it would just be incredibly yeah. difficult. I'm not saying it's unscriptural for a man to preach who may have an, an unbelieving wife or even for a congregation to ask a man to come work with him, uh, knowing that his wife uh, would not be a part of that. But uh, it, I just, <clears throat> from a purely practical standpoint, uh, I don't know how I would be able to do it. Well, Paul, you, you've heard, you've probably read this from me, and I know John heard it. I, I said it from the pulpit down in Oklahoma when I was there. I'm satisfied that every work I've ever enjoyed with, with brethren through 40-some years of doing this, I'm satisfied that all of those brethren hired Nancy and just let me do the preaching. And uh, I I just couldn't do any of this without Nan. Well, and you bring up an interesting point, and I hear this in prayer sometimes uh, frequently. You know, people will say um, that that uh, Eric and Sarah labor here or whatever. You know, there is this concept of sort of hiring the couple. I don't know if that's, you know, that's an interesting concept. And I've, I've thought about that before, and I've thought that, that might deserve some kind of study and introspection is that is that an accurate way of looking are you hiring the family or or if even if hire is the right word some people would say hire is the wrong word but are you supporting and i guess you are supporting the family but does yeah, that mean the children are working there too and you know yeah you absolutely are and and, and i i was in a i was in a workshop a few months ago and there were two different guys. Question kind of, one of them said, you know, he says, absolutely, I see my wife as like a full partner. This is a 50-50 deal. You hire me, you hire my wife. And the other guy said, if you're going to hire my wife and expect her to do stuff, then you better pay her a salary. Ooh, <laughs> wow. And so I was, that that was interesting back and forth. I mean, you know, there's no real consensus on that at all. Right. And, and, uh, and even and, 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 and a thing like that, a setup like that. I, I thought it was interesting to listen to. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, maybe there's might be some kind of happy medium between those two positions, but I don't know. Uh, right. No. 
But that's suggesting the wife would do nothing. Hmm? Towards the work right. of day. <laughs> well, I mean, the idea the idea that was being met, put across is that if you're going to if you're going to hire the preacher but have all these extra expectations of his wife, yeah. oh, you better okay. pay the wife for those extra expectations. Gotcha. Or you better not have them. One of the two. I understand what um, Mike was saying about you know the assistance his wife provides. I, I agree with that. My wife, uh, if for no one else, she makes me able to do the work that I do. Um, someone to be at home with and private and, and be able to talk to and someone who supports mm -hmm. the work that I do uh, helps me to see yeah. Um, well, and, and like you, Paul, if I've got concerns on my mind, Nan's the one I'll sound them off on yes. to find out what her take is on it as to whether or not I need to proceed in that or change the letter or change the way I talk to somebody. But, She's a good sounding board for that, and uh, you talk about a good PR person, that's my wife. And I think that all of us that are married and, and working in this capacity, we, we have to say that about our wives. They're better looking than we are to start with. <laughs> well, in, a, in addition, though, I wanted to make another point, and that is that I know of multiple preachers who have trouble staying any place very long because of their wives not being helpers in that work. Uh, instead, they're just the opposite. They... Yeah, uh, they, they, they stir up struggles there, and you probably know those situations too. Right. Yeah. And I remember when I was first considering going into preaching, people talked to Sarah. I thought this was very helpful, but some other preachers' wives would see me somewhere, and they would, um, they would talk to Sarah, and and there's a special struggle that maybe we don't appreciate of being a preacher's wife, and there's a lot of pressures and and things that come with that, and um, that would be an interesting topic to dive into sometime. I don't know. Right. Yeah, you know, to give my to give my for what it's worth, oh, uh, you know, I, I I never totally thought about it, but but it perfectly makes sense that that in the prayer and it's and it's done here for us, you know, you know, be be with him and his family as they labor with us. I mean, you can't separate them. You you, 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 you absolutely cannot separate the the wife from the husband. <laughs> Uh, not now. Now the expectation—that's another issue. I, I'm talking about from the standpoint of, uh, you know, if if you expect the wife to be down at the building and be the one that's going to clean the building and make the, and and, and, and bake the communion bread, <laughs> and, and 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 be on be the woman that's beck and called for uh, when it, when another woman in the congregation has a struggle, then, then she's the one you expect to. Then, then, you know, like you said, I mean, you, you, if you're going to hire her, <laughs> not that you, not that, you, but I mean, the the treatment of that type of an idea. So I, but I definitely see the idea of praying for the family because they come and go together. There's a lot we can talk about in in just regards to this. Um, right. I, I've I've told a story one time a preacher. The men asked the preacher to, you know, once a week or twice a week to water some flesh, you know, trees they had planted and everything, and he would have to drag the water hose. And he basically, as it was reported to me, so this may not be true, but as reported to me, refused to do that, saying that wasn't in his job description. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, there's, it's, um, thing what, is, why we're, we're dealing there? with people. Yes. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. And and you yeah, have an attitude problem that's bigger there. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Go back to uh, who was it talking about the difference between the I think it might have been Mike, but the difference between the office and and a work. Okay, um, <laughs> a preacher is a member of a congregation like all the other members are. Now he does have a very specific responsibility, but that doesn't, doesn't preclude him from helping out in the other areas. I mean, I'm not put on the yard mowing list because I'm a special man. No, it's just that we have enough young men to do it. They don't need me to do it. But I'd be happy to get out there and mow the yard if needed be, right. you know. But but there there've been some whose mindset is I'm hired to preach and I'm going to preach and that's all that I'm supposed to do. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, well, guys, I, I I took us past the hour with this. I do appreciate all your thoughts and comments on it. I, and and to me, this these are the real problems that sometimes preachers either bring on themselves 
or they face. You know, Paul had his challenges that he had to deal with, and um, sometimes we we either cause the problems ourselves. And there's a, I you know I like the discussion about the preacher's wife and and you know, what Eric said. That might be an interesting study at some point just to kind of talk about about that. I don't. I don't. It may not be appropriate to. It'd be interesting to have our wives give input in some way to that. It'd be interesting. Oh, that wouldn't be scriptural to have them on camera, would it? They could sit right <laughs> off camera, though, right? <laughs> uh, no, put in the chat room. I was gonna say before my. Did you see every once in a while something like this happens to me? <laughs> I was gonna say before my phone rang that uh, Eric's comment was right on target because um, whether we think it's right or scriptural, or uh, ought to be that way, or anything else, uh, our wives are held to a higher standard than the average yes, they are. lady in the congregation. They are. Yeah. They are. And, uh, I like to work in a cold evenings, Sunday evenings, or even Sunday mornings, you know, wear a pair of slacks. It is just too cold. And, and she looked very presentable. Uh, not, I'm not saying, uh, you know, holy jeans or anything, but... Uh, uh, as in with holes in them, but <laughs> but a nice pair of dress slacks, you know, and a sweater. I said it'll be fine. She goes, no. <laughs> uh, people, whether I think so or not, she she senses that uh, she has to set a certain level that no one else might be thought yeah. negatively of, you know. And that's just a one minor example, but uh, they are held to a higher standard. That's right. That's right. All right, uh, let's see. Any other thoughts or comments on this? Um, we've had our own little chat going in our private chat room. I see if there's anything there that we might want to bring out, but we're about five after. Five well, after it, yeah, for, for a future topic, it would be interesting to, I would like to hear you guys' thoughts too. On we've, we, You use the word hire and interview and those, but yeah. there's some interesting thoughts about the relationship between the evangelist and the congregation and the evangelist and the elders and... Um, you know, it's not like a normal uh, employee-employer relationship. But I, I'd I'd like to dive into that. Some maybe between books, we can do some topical <laughs> studies like that. That'd be a good idea. I mean, think about it. how many members in the congregation can the elders go up to and say, "Well, we appreciate you working with us here, but <laughs> yeah, we're ready for you to move on." <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> That's a good point. Um, all right. Well, we'll try to remember. I, I think it'll be an interesting discussion. You know, very much so. All right, well, let's plan next week to pick up with verse tw uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Does that sound good? Everybody? All right. Sounds good to me. All right, well, let's see. Uh, any other final thoughts or comments? Let's uh, check, start with you, Brian. No, I think, I think not. I think we brought out some really great points on this and uh, uh, look forward to actually getting into chapter 12 next week. That's, uh, that's one of particular interest to me. Absolutely, definitely. It, it, I, I was glad we couldn't make it into it because yeah. we wanted to spend some time with that third heaven stuff. And <laughs> um, Eric, any thoughts or comments? I, I know a man who plans to be here next week to join in. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Paul, <laughs> how about you? Oh, I'm just glad to be able to be here and uh, look forward to next time. I hope you feel better next week, Paul. Oh, I appreciate that. Mike? Thank you ever so much. Uh, like I say every week, this just charges my batteries for the rest of the week. I kind of wish we could do this two or three times a week, to be quite honest with you. Uh, and to give you a plug, I know of several people that won't join the chat. They won't ever tell you, but they've told me in private conversations and emails and such. We've got an audience, guys, and I'm pleased for that. Well, I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad they find it beneficial. And sharing with us, share with us, and that. Yeah. He didn't say um, they found it beneficial. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Paul and I were using. We wonder if there's someone out there listening just to find fodder, you know. <laughs> um, and like you know, me teaching evolution. Uh, go ahead, Wayne. Any <laughs> uh, You know, once again, I'm just glad to be part of this study. It's always an encouragement to uh, be able to study with others who are like-minded. Proclaimers of the faith. So thank you all.
Well, we appreciate you, Wayne. We appreciate you, Wayne, very much. Well, thank you so much for joining us, and Lord willing, if all goes well and the creek don't rise or whatever else might hinder our areas, we'll plan to continue our discussion next Wednesday um, at 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time. That'll be noon in the Eastern Time Zone. 9 a.m. Pacific Time. 10 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. Anyone else? 5 a.m. in Fiji. Right here at live.truthfactor.com. Have a wonderful week.